thanks to our speakers, both past and present. Today, just to remind you, we have three speakers talking about painting the Anthropocene, nature, landscape, and ownership. We have Judith Belzer, Philip Govader, and Elsa Munoz. Um, thank you for everyone who participates in these conversations. And I want to give a special thank you today for everyone who's here and joined us from the US. I know that these days are full of tension and anxiety. Um, we started the dialogue six months ago, and it was a direct response to confinement and the need to build exchange and community, as well as to create a positive counterweight to the cancellation of numerous cultural projects. It's been a wonderfully enriching experience, and I couldn't have imagined the interest and support it would generate. For me, it's really a journey of discovery and learning. With every speaker, I learn something new and question previously held ideas. And this constant renegotiation is one of the guiding principles of the dialogues. Um, so I invite you all to continue this inquisitive journey as we address our session today about the Anthropocene. Um, and before we turn to our speakers, Judith Bautzer, Philip Govader, and Elsa Munoz, I, will all, all, I always give a brief introduction to our subject, so I'm going to do that first. The difficulty with these introductions is that as soon as I start pinning ideas down, I'm palpably aware of having glimpsed through a, the crack of an opening door to huge subjects that I've yet so much to learn about. Nothing in the dialogues could exist if it weren't for so many makers and thinkers who add to the complexity of human consciousness. Today, I'll take each word in the session title to unpack some of the ideas it represents and masks hopefully highlighting the danger in headlines and oversimplification. Let's start with Anthropocene, an increasingly popular term used to denote the current geological age in which human activity has been the dominant force on the Earth's environment. This session on the Anthropocene will be the first of more to come as the subject is so vast and messy. And yet the very term Anthropocene needs deconstructing. It places human beings, anthropos, at center stage in a devastating crescendo of environmental collapse, at least in relation to the Earth's livability for countless species. When in reality, and here citing Anna Lohenhaupt Singh, it's a, and I'd quote her, patchy Anthropocene. And to totalize the category of human beings is to ignore, and to quote her again, capitalist and colonialist insults the, the very heart of our current geological age. It's after all a focus on immediate gain, exploitation of people, land and animals, as well as a disregard for sustainability that has got us where we are. Alternative terms that take these critiques into account include capitalocene, a focus on capital and capitalism as a determining force, and plantationocene that specifically addresses the logic of colonialism in the existing dynamics of land use, exploitation and violence. I'd like to take a pause here to acknowledge and to recognize the atrocities, the genocides and the violence that European colonialism and its ongoing power structures has caused and continues to cause throughout the world. Another complex and ultimately political term we're looking at today and that needs unpacking is nature. It quickly evokes the nature culture divide to be found in Western philosophical paradigms and the birth of anthropology and is at the very core of anthropocentrism. The nature culture divide categorizes human beings as exceptional in the natural world, separated from the rest by a propensity to develop culture not only does nature culture as a dichotomy create a hierarchy where nature is a force to be dominated by the rational thinking mind, but culture becomes something specific to human beings, not exempt of its own internal hierarchization. And so the pedestal of human exceptionalism is well underway. And at the same time, man is dislocating himself um, from his environment. The chasm open between nature and culture is typical of dualistic thinking, thinking, which solidified during the Enlightenment and sees terms as mutually exclusive rather than interdependent or even entangled. 
the focus on spaces where nature and culture collide is recurrent in Judith Belzer's work. Landscape is related to nature, but it's clearly within the realm of what has been tamed by man and is no longer to be feared. Landscapes are parcels of natural world, already subjected to domination and ownership. In the history of landscape painting, two trends are prominent. Firstly, the romantic exaltation when facing in some way even capturing the sublime. There's awe and terror in this feat. And yet, if you think of Caspar David Friedrich's iconic wander above the sea of fog, heroic anthropocentrism is carved into the compositional axis. X literally marks the spot, the spot where man, and it's not a big leap here to think white colonizing man, thanks to his reason and his culture, has dominated nature. This complex relationship between nature, awe and control has come up a number of times in conversations with Philip Govardhan, and the ways in which landscapes are forged by these forces is key in his paintings. The second trend is that of painting the landscape you own or have access to, a form of recording that quickly raises questions of ownership, land use and access. Colonialism and capitalism have wreaked destruction on the environment, many communities and indigenous peoples throughout the world. Neither colonialism nor capitalism are concerned with the devastation caused and they prioritize immediate exploitation and gain. Our political and economic systems and institutions continue to support short-term thinking in direct contrast to the sustainable models we know are needed. A sustainability that can be found in many models of uh, modes of interacting within nature that have been destroyed and silenced. Given the power relations embedded in our interaction with our surrounding landscape, access to nature becomes something that is reserved to those with privilege. And I'd like to thank Elsa Munoz for having shown me how, within this context, the, acts of, the act of painting landscapes can also become a polit political act of reappropriation. We live in a world where various tipping points related to climate change have been breached. We know this and yet still allow the devastating systems that place exploitation and profit in the driving seat. It's a strange delusion we live in, a world that we somehow know that no longer exists. Just as when we look to this night sky, we know that many stars are simply echoes of long gone suns an effect of time over space transmitting information that is no longer there. Similarly, we know our current way of life is the reverberation of an ecosystem already condemned to the past. While we have this growing melancholia for a future lost, we continue to support the structures that have wreaked the havoc. One thing is clear in the Anthropocene, the anthropocentrism and capitalism at its core so central to current structures that exalt individualism, put heroes on pedestals, and cling on to enlightened ideals and colonizing economies. Both are in need of radical reimagining. We need to forge new visions of the world in order to change the power structures we have today and the systemic inequalities that persist throughout their very architectures. The narratives we use, including those forged through pigment, allow us to catch a glimpse of the complexities of the world we've built and need to remold. And this is a quote from Susie Gablik. The need to transform the egocentric vision that is encoded in our entire worldview is the crucial task that lies ahead of our, of our culture. The issue is whether art will rise to the occasion. And we should remember that she said that almost 30 years ago now. Rather than delegate creativity and imagination to the realms of curiosity or aesthetic pleasure, our future may depend on our ability to radically reimagine and reimage the world. Though I also believe that voting is a pretty good start too. I've purposely left out the word painting so this introduction doesn't grow any longer. And instead I want to point to painting as one of the many ways in which worldviews and narratives can be represented. Today's session brings together three speakers who, like myself and many here, are painters. Their work tackles different facets of representing our world as it is today, and the complexities underpinning nature, landscape, and ownership. So I'd like to welcome again Elsa Munoz, 
Philip Govardhan and Judith Beltzer. And I'm Elena Sadler, and I'll be moderating the conversation. So I'd like to start the conversation by asking each of you a question and just seeing where it takes us. Um, Judith, if you're happy to start. Sure. So the relationship um, between nature and culture, as I mentioned, is being constant in your work. And you often use juxtaposition and scale, kind of extreme points of view to throw us into a new, as I see it, more critical visioning of our impact of the environment. Can you talk a little bit more about how that's developed in your work? Sure. First of all, I just want to say that I'm delighted to be here and so happy to be in conversation with you, Alina, and Elsa and Philip. So it's a pleasure. To, thank you for having me. Um, I, I think my work has been a long journey through a lot of different ways of thinking about this. Um, I started my painting life on the East Coast, where I am right now. And the New England landscape is one which you feel sort of in a one-to-one -one kind of ratio relationship with the landscape around you. I, I started painting because um, I was living in New York and came up to New England and we purchased my then boyfriend, now husband, and I bought a little teeny house in the country that we could barely afford. Um, and there was really no place to work inside. So I started painting outside and we were literally also at the same time digging out a garden, um, trying to figure out what it meant to be on the land that we had bought and to have a relationship with this place. And so, and this was really early on in my work life. My work life really literally developed out of the ground here because I had to step outside the door to paint. I just started painting outside because that was my choice, uh, my only choice. <laughs> And um, as my work developed, it really became about this relationship I was, I was making with the land. Um, and that was a very interesting experience and really invited it, it uh, in this process, I was really thinking about um, the American relationship to landscape and how we've made it something very remote in our experience in many ways and sort of 19th century way of having the landscape that's something out there to enjoy only at holiday time or, um, at special times of the year and it's sort of going to be there no matter what happens and the work I was doing here just outside my door looking at very mundane everyday things had to do with making an intimate relationship with the landscape and thinking of myself as a part of it and not seeing it as something so far away but in the early 2000s I moved to California and there was a very big sort of disruption in my way of thinking about my sense of self in the landscape and as I moved across the west sort of mimicking the 19th century work white colonialists, I was having the experience of my sense of self really diminishing in the landscape, becoming very much like a smaller being when I got, by the time I got to the West Coast. So my relationship to the land was, and the, my sense of experience in the landscape was really altered. And that sort of disjuncture, I think, disjun you know, this change really um, encouraged me to open up a new way of looking at all these issues. So whereas here I was thinking about our direct relationship with nature, all of a sudden it was, it was uh, very dramatically played out in the Bay Area where I live, um, where I could really see what that relationship was about on a much larger scale. So whereas I was looking in in a very intimate way to nature, when I got to the West Coast, it really opened up. And I looked up and out from walking up in the hills in Berkeley in the in the Bay Area across from San Francisco and started to see because of the geology of the area, you have all these different landscapes jamming up against each other in a very dramatic fashion. So it really sort of opened my eyes and really changed my perspective to really take a look at exactly how we were entering into these landscapes and altering them. I don't know if that is a way to open. Do you want me to go on or? <laughs> no, that's great. It's, I, I'll, I'll ask a question to each of you and I, I'm sure that you can each also pick up from things that have come up from each other because a lot of the ideas um, cross over. That's fantastic. Um, and it's very implicated within the actual living in the land as well, which is really interesting. Um, Philip, in your work, you have layers of almost kind of symbolic and cartographical annotations that create, as I see it, a really stratified pictorial language, which I um, find fascinating. It kind of attests to this crazy, complex, and quite often destructive um, implication of land use and ownership. How do you navigate that balance between the aesthetic awe and the growing anxiety? It's something that's come up in the conversations that we've had. Well, first of all, thank you, <clears throat> Elsa and uh, Judith and um, Elena, uh, for um, doing this and um, allowing me to be part of it. 
Um, I think uh, Judith uh, talking about painting as a journey, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's really, I think, true of my own experience too. I grew up in Eastern Oregon in a small town. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time in sort of the high desert and in the mountains um, in Idaho. So I think it became a kind of a, some connection to land and landscape of that variety really sort of becomes embedded in your DNA. Um, I uh, painted um, like most people, I work representationally and tried different things and I was an abstract painter then in the early 2000s, right about the time of the um, earthquake, um, in Seattle, um, I lost my studio. Um, and it actually was in a conference, uh, college art conference, and I turned on the TV and they had an image of my studio building. So um, I knew something was serious. Anyway, I decided at that point, and it was really kind of good timing, that I wanted to go back to observation, um, which I hadn't been, I'd been working abstractly, but I just really felt the need to do that. And I decided to paint the landscape because that's something which my work was sort of moving towards. Uh, it was moving in that direction in any case. So I thought all these questions came to mind. What do I paint? What, what interests me? Do I want to paint? You know, and I, there are all these sort of historical models, but there was one area in South Seattle, the Duwamish Waterway, which is um, an area where there were Duwamish Indian villages. And it was a area where they did fishing and there was all sorts of wildlife. Um, this particular area in the early, um, 1900s was dramatically reconfigured through a dredging of a ship canal and the ship canal with all these billions of tons of mud ended up making an island which is Harbor Island <clears throat> um, but that area is a super fun site and it is tremendously um, defiled by all sorts of um, pollution including lead cadmium mercury all sorts of phthalates PCBs uh, fecal, um, um, what is it, um, <laughs> on and on, petroleum. So it was a very, so it was fraught with a kind of history. And I was interested in going there and saying, well, how, if I paint this, how will I deal with what I know about this place? Because the other thing about it is there are still salmon runs up that waterway to this day. There are fish um, in the salmon actually apparently are not contaminated, but other uh, species, there are signs there says do not fish. So anyway, I was, I worked from nature. I did a lot of studies from life and little by little, I found myself wanting to paint the distant view, something about getting away from it, a kind of perspective that is different. I think of, you know, the Apollo 8 astronauts, the kind of iconic moment when they see the earth from a distance and perceive it differently. And I find the distant um, distance sort of gives you a different perspective being outside of the landscape. Um, so um, I then went and I did uh, looked at different sites. The Kennecott Copper Mine in um, Southern or in, in Utah is the largest open pit mine in the world. And it was a source of inspiration, but my current painting, I don't work directly from, I don't from drawings or I don't use photographs, but I found it really fascinating as a narrative of human intervention, but also um, visually really compelling. So in my paintings, um, I think, you know, my paintings are derived from a combination of memory and imagination. Um, I see myself really a, in a kind of a neutral role, a sort of an agnostic relationship to the landscape in that I am presenting this thing and I let people come to their own conclusions. Um, so um, anyway, that's kind of, <laughs> I guess, the evolution of where I came and what I'm doing now if that's so. it's fascinating because the the idea of shifting perspective which is also linked to that idea of scale and juxtaposition is one of the things that brought me to the anthropocene when i first kind of looked at it and wrote an article about it a, a while ago and it's where i first discovered um some of your work and it's interesting to think that that iconic kind of earth rise image is suddenly shifting us into a point of view where we're not the center of the world, um, like in Renaissance perspective where, and that's something that I think we need to kind of explore further. Um, it might come up today in the session, but it's also something that I'd like to kind of unpack further in, in the future in the dialogues. Um, and it, 
kind of connects the work of all three of you because it's about shifting perspectives and creating new perspectives on the way in which we actually relate to the landscape. And also your paintings explore a dialogue with being disconnected from, um, or you've written as well about being disconnected from indigenous embodied systems of knowledge based on sustainability and respect. Um, and unlike the current models that focus on land ownership and exploitation, and I'd love you to kind of explain a little bit how painting the landscape becomes a political act in that context. So first of all, of course, thank you so much. That intro was really good. Like I want a copy of that intro actually. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, I mean, the question of, of how I came to understand that, um, that there is a power dynamic happening in my work, it came um, very slowly. And to be honest with you, about two years ago, I was applying to grad school. And uh, so my portfolio consisted of, of these kind of aesthetically pleasing kind of classical landscapes, right? And I, I go on to write, uh, you know, like a, a paper about how beauty and the access to, to beauty is, um, is like a primal focus to me as an artist. And I submitted this paper first uh, for someone at this institution. It, it's like a, a top five grad program. And I had like some kind of connection to someone who knew someone. And uh, that person was like, let me look over your paper first to see if I think you have a good chance of getting in. So this person reads, my paper and, and she comes back and she's just like, if you want to be accepted into this program, you need to make work about trauma, not beauty, right? Like being a person of color kind of pigeonholes me into um, the words that she used were, if you, wanted to, if you wanna do work about landscape, you can do work about dystopian landscapes, not beauty. And I just kind of like, I came away with that uh, thinking, if that isn't political, I don't know what is, right? Like the determination of who has access to beauty, right? And so that's the first part of it. Now, the second part of it, like I think of, of painting, uh, um, you know, these intimate, reverent paintings of nature as being um, a way of tending to the wound of colonialism. Right, like I, I think that there are various ways to approach how we how how we do this work, and and painting for me is is my way of doing that. Like that intimacy, that quiet, and furthermore, um, I don't know. I just think a lot about. Um, so I'm interested in 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 trauma, in trauma work, and um, the goal of of healing is to heal a person's central nervous system. That's essentially what we're trying to do with like body work. And um, I've, I've found personally by painting things that are beautiful, by reading poetry, by being in the presence of something beautiful, it really does calm the central nervous system. So I'm like, that's my little contribution to the world as far as I, I, can, I can do something. Like I, I am looking to give the the audience like a, a little moment of quiet in a very chaotic traumatic environment that we're always surrounded by that's my answer that's great and and it's it's so interesting the the dual movement of kind of almost the reflexive quality that painting and the idea of different points of view can create but also the the calming and introspective quality it can bring and it's what's really exciting is that there is no one way of making work and it's all about really developing a kind of coherent language in that work which I think all three of you do kind of in a way that I'm I'm very much in awe of um, and it's wonderful to have you here because of that not just the work itself but also the the coherence of the engagement with the work which for me is really powerful what I'd love to do is also, if you have questions for one another, by all means, kind of, um, or, or thoughts that have come up from what's already come up, 
um, do you just continue? And otherwise, I've got some questions that we can carry on with as well. I, I just wanted to say, Elsa, I think what you said about beauty and the idea that somehow, given your uh, background, that you have to somehow, um, you know, deal with uh, kind of a fraught sort of approach. Um, you know, I don't think there's a contradiction between, I mean, I want to make beautiful paintings, and yet at the same time, you can, I think by creating a sense of awe and transcendence and wonder, you can bring someone to a different kind of understanding of a phenomenon, start to question our place in the world, our role as a species. You know, species have, life on earth has changed the planet, whether it's our species or not, but we have come to a moment, a critical point of population and, you know, influence and so forth. But, but somehow it's sort of like a great novel it might be a tragedy, but if it's beautifully crafted, it somehow becomes believable. And I, so I, completely understand and um, appreciate what you're saying. Thank you for that. And, and I, I feel like it's important to add, um, so uh, I grew up in an inner city neighborhood in Chicago, no green spaces, right? So just the act of, of me painting the landscape where I didn't have, I don't have a one-to-one -one connection. I don't have an, a, a, an embodied relationship with nature. Like, my way into nature was was a childhood that needed to, I mean, I needed to remain indoors in order to be safe. Like it was a violent neighborhood. And what I did was read poetry. And um, like Walt Whitman and Wordsworth were like my introduction into nature. Like I was imagining beautiful things because I was reading beautiful words but that was not supported by my immediate reality, right? So like that became my way of like, that was my introduction into feeling my way into a relationship with nature. But even in painting it, I was, I was like uh, talking to Alina about this. I'm like, it, it, it dawned on me that um, I, th I had like an imposter syndrome about um, like, do I have a right to paint nature, right? Like if I don't, I don't own land. I don't have a, a I don't have a one-to-one -one lived in embodied relationship with nature. Do I have a right to paint it? And um, it became a question of belonging to, uh, you know, for me, uh, um, it, 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 it was like a very, this deep reckoning, reckoning about, um, about belonging, like I have a right to paint the land that I that I'm a part of, right? Like I belong, I belong to nature. Nature belongs to me. Like we are in a reciprocal relationship. But and it it might seem very obvious for me to say that, but it it was like a really big deal for me to come to that. I'm wondering else if you could tell us a little bit about how where your imagery is derived from them i'm interested to know if you're responding to things you're reading and then developing imagery for your work or is it now based on places you visited or memory or could you say i'm curious because obviously yeah. it was a, a hard process for you and i'm really curious and looking over your shoulder there at what you're working on to know a little bit more about that yes thank you um so a combination i i think my my aesthetic really derived from poetry. Like I have a, a in fact, like my, my favorite poem, uh, my favorite poet is Rilke. And he's kind of a, of a dark nature poet. Like he's got a, 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 a numinous relationship to nature. And that kind of established my, my aesthetic sen sensibility, I think. Uh, and then slowly I started collecting imagery from like taking trips to Mexico with my parents, like these big skies and just a lot of space. And I was just kind of responding to things that, that made me feel good, you know? And then, um, yeah, like I don't, I won't get into it, but like um, the controlled burn series that you might see behind me, those are of course all photographs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But an aesthetic, you know, my aesthetic was born way before I could paint, for sure. Thanks. Thank you, Judith. I'm I'm curious about you because I, uh, in spending time on on your website, I realized that you write quite a bit, and I really enjoyed your writing. 
Has that always been a part of your practice? Yeah, for sure, it's part of my practice, actually, but a useful one. I mean, the writing comes after the work. I usually, I tend to do work in series. And often if I'm having a show or posting work on my website or whatever, I feel like it's a good occasion to sit down and in some way think about it in a, in a way to talk about it. And, you know, I have people come to my studio. I find learn, the process of learning how to speak about my work has been challenging for me. Um, I would say, you know, I work very intuitively. Um, my experience of the landscape has been based very much based on a visceral experience of it. It's it's not was not really attached to language for me. So um, that's been a, a, a slow process to learn how to to in some way tell something that means something for me and doesn't sort of lapse into sort of art speak, which I find pretty yeah, challenging. <laughs> um, and I, I agree. I think Alina's introduction was fantastic in that way. Um, I really enjoyed what you had to say. So writing about it has been interesting, and it, I think often um, the ideas that, that, I, that we speak about in a situation like this come almost after the work itself, um, because the work really, for me, really grows out of itself. Um, it's very self-generative, and I usually work on a lot of things at once, and I'm not, I really don't know where it's going often. And after I've sort of gotten to the end of one series, I can feel the anxiety building, not really sure where I'm gonna go but I have to have some sort of trust, even though in the moment I don't have much sense of trust that it's going, you know, that something is going to come and sort of make a new pathway for me. Um, and it's through that whole process that I start to really understand what it is that I'm thinking about. <laughs> and as Philip was saying, I'm really not interested in providing directives or telling people how to think. It's really the questions I'm asking of myself. And I'm hoping to invite people to ask questions themselves too, that they perhaps bring their own sort of visceral experience of these places that I'm alluding to in some way. And they're all out of my head. I don't use photographs. I don't, I don't make drawings ahead of time. I'm very much about directly going to the paintings and the drawings are something very separate unto themselves. Um, but, you know, I've, I have thought a lot about my relationship and our, our especially American sense of what the landscape is and about especially after I moved to the West Coast, having experienced that shift and thinking about the way people moved across this country and took over land that didn't belong to them and displaced other people. Um, thinking about, um, you know, that sense of who we are and the idea of manifest destiny and that somehow this land was divinely supposed, you know, that we told us our story was this land was divinely here for us and the resources were endlessly there for us. And I'm, you know, asking questions about that and thinking about who owns this land and who, you know, what we've done to it and this whole move to the West, it seemed to be all forward moving with no looking back to consider the consequences of the way in which we moved across the land. So um, I've been thinking of that, about that a lot. For I took a brief detour during work outside of this country about the Panama Canal. And around the time of the 16 elections, I returned to the American landscape and thinking about issues here because it seems so critical for me to try to make some sense of what was going on here politically. Um, and I did a whole series of work having to do with dams in the Southwest because it seemed like such an incredibly interesting metaphor, a kind of location, a place that connects to the sort of American ethos of our relationship to the land. So, and then, after that work sort of has grown out of the, actually the piles of rock that were around the edges of the dams where they met up with the man-made landscape. And now thinking of sort of, it's been the work now currently sort of out of the direct landscape and has become more of a metaphorical landscape about um, the things that we thought were solid in our world, including the environment, but also our political institutions and the very nature of what we thought was true and nature, these things are seem very precarious and and out of balance. So this is sort of gives a little bit more sense of where I'm coming from. But the writing of it has been challenging. But um, like making a painting, I find it's also a useful way to think. Writing is a way to think about things too. And I start off writing about I don't really know where I'm going to go, just like I don't know in a painting. And that's so I, I learned through the process there as well. And I just want to say that I, I really appreciate your writing because I, I I just really appreciate artists who are generous. Like, I feel like your, your writing is very accessible and it really, yeah, it's just very generous with the audience. And I just, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's, 
it, it's a really interesting question, this whole idea of kind of visual languages and verbal languages. And one of the things that I'm really conscious with when making conversations that bring painters together and talking about painting is not to fall into the trap of a sort of hermeneutic approach to painting, a kind of interpretation of painting and saying, this is what this painting is about. Because I believe that we can talk about ideas, but they kind of sit at a sort of meta level. And we can have this conversation, which I, for me, these conversations are absolutely fascinating. Um, and learning about the engagement of the process and how the making comes about, not just in a technical sense, but in a conceptual sense. And how this um, is really interesting, Judith, what you were saying about the writing comes afterwards. But I wonder also if that process of kind of digestion and writing also then maybe influences future paintings. And so there's this kind of whole thing. I mean, I think just as when you're working on paintings in your studio, I don't know if Philip and Elsa feel this way, but I feel that the paintings are in conversation with one another also. And I'm, I mean, I tend to have a busy hand, so I like to have a lot of things going and I, and I, and I, you know, run into times when I just don't know where I'm going and I, it's good to be able to move around the room. So I just find, I mean, this is, I think this is how humans engage with the world too, hopefully. You're open and learning to process what you come in contact with. And, you know, I think it's such an important, you know, as I, as I age, I think one of the benefits of getting a little bit older is that I've had experience, a lot of different experiences, and I'm understanding the process of how you walk out the door and meet with, you know, encounter what you do encounter and make use of that to continue to grow and continue to learn. So writing is one of those processes. Painting is one of the, is like that, but walking is like that for me also, um, you know, Sometimes people joke that I collect imagery at 50 miles an hour driving around in the car, but um, I, my preferred way is really to be in a place and to experience it and then come back to the studio and the work is really hopefully about the, what it feels like the, to be in places and to engage with it intellectually and viscerally. And so not to have it be a straight representation or a depiction of something, but equally not to have it be a painting about painting, but have it to be something that is connected to my direct experience which is not just in the studio, but is also out in the world. A lot of what um, um, Judith said in terms of her approach to painting and um, having no particular expectation and being sort of, um, you know, lost uh, in the, the wild is really kind of Very echoes my whole, my whole process. I really have no idea specifically of what I'm doing when I start a painting. I think people often have the misconception. They'll say, well, what were you thinking when you did this painting? What did you have in mind? I had nothing in mind. However, as one evolves, we get ideas and this thing sort of grows into a certain kind of um, idea that you want to express through your work. And it happens in really sort of magical ways. And I think um, I find myself often kind of talking to myself as the painting has evolved, almost like writing as I'm trying to understand what I'm doing. And I think for me, um, it's very interesting because I had started as an abstract painter, but having the, the world as a reference, but also other issues of, you know, involvement with geography, but um, land use, food production, all of these things are so integral to our understanding of who we are as human beings in relation to nature, in relation to the planet. I think these things are inextricably related and, and out, out of that, in the, in the best moments come um, something really special, I think, in painting. And it's interesting how in the conversations we've had, and it's something that I wanted to ask you, Philip, but also it, it, this notion that Judith was bringing up of moving in the landscape, being a part of us actually engaging with the way we understand the world, not just this kind of enlightenment rationalization that happens all in kind of like the cogito area and the kind of the brain area, um, but that there's actually something about being embodied in a place and the disembodiment that's happened through that. Now, Philip, you've talked about the, the kind of psychological impact of the subject that you work with and, and the way that kind of develops and Elsa about the embodied thinking. So I don't know if either of you want to throw more about that psychology of the kind of involvement with painting. I'll let Philip go. <laughs> I'll let Elsa go. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I mean, I, I do obsess about these ideas. Like I, I think that if I, if I weren't a painter, I would, I would practice, um, I would practice some type of somatic healing um, method because I really do, you know, I am, I'm ultra aware of, of trauma, just like, I, I know that, that we all experience trauma to some degree, but um, growing up in the particular neighborhood that I did, like you, you're just, um, you're just aware of all, like the Venn diagram, right? Like there's, there's violence and there's displacement and there's death and, you know, there are a lot of deep layers to living in certain environments. And I, I just kind of, I'm, I'm always thinking psychologically about what I, what I offer, what I'm activating through my artwork. Like it, it feels, I don't know, like I, I've thought about um, the language that we use about making, uh, when people of color make work about trauma as being uh, witnessing, right? Like we're, we, they are making work about being a witness to this trauma. And I agree, like that needs to be done. And uh, uh, to some degree though, I, I question how, how that can also be re-traumatizing, right? Like to, to be constantly told to explain your trauma, to display, to, to display, to explain, and it can be re-traumatizing to the neighborhood, the community that has experienced that firsthand. And so I, yeah, like I just always lead with, I do, I think about the audience a lot. Like it's, it's never a, I'm, I'm not necessarily doing work for me or out of, you know, just like this uh, simply an internal need. Like I'm, I'm thinking about the psychology of people who are, who are approaching this work and that maybe they just need a moment of silence, a moment of of quiet a moment of beauty like that's all i'm trying to do I, you know i think just um for myself going into nature and i think you know the duwamish waterway was kind of an example of the how important it was to me for me to be in the landscape to be there at different times of day to be feeling the temperature even the smells like sometimes you'd have a kind of a smell of some kind of, you know, something that didn't feel like it was part of a natural environment. Um, and all of these things affect, I think, how you interpret something through paint. They really affect your decisions. I think there were times when I was doing that that were very kind of exalted and it, it, it was beautiful. There were gray hair and I saw nature and other times where I was, because of my knowledge of the subject matter, it became kind of oppressive. And I still have a, I have a sort of, it's sort of like a relationship that I had and ended. I have a kind of fondness. And yet when I left, when I stopped that series of paintings, I was kind of relieved. I felt really in the end, it was kind of a depressing environment. <clears throat> so I think, and the interesting thing is when we read paintings, if I look at Elsa's or Judith's paintings, what we know, our knowledge of the world makes us or allows us to read those paintings very differently. So what we bring to it in terms of our experience, um, I think, you know, really is very, very important in terms of what we get from the painting um, as a result. I agree. And I think when paintings are open themselves, they allow people to bring their different experiences in and they're not being, not telling you what to do and what to think about. Um, and I think, you know, I've had the experience and I think we all have where you see a work of art or somebody comes see something you make and people have wildly different experiences of the same image, um, which I actually, that's always very gratifying when that happens because some of the work feels incredibly agitating to certain people and other people find to be just exuberant. So that the idea of this high energy in, in some of the work could have diametrically opposite effects on people on a psychological level is interesting to me. And in many ways, the work is expressive of my own agitation about the imagery I'm, I'm engaging with. Um, but I'm always interested at the incredible variety of responses that a single image can elicit from different people. And I think that's actually, you know, is an exciting thing about doing this kind of work. Um, because, you know, you can invite somebody to uh, have a very calming response or uh, perhaps that calming quiet can be agitating to somebody else actually. Um, so 
just that, you know, no, no experience is just one thing, I think is what it comes, for me, it comes down to in the same way, heading out into the world and thinking about things, you know, it can be both beautiful and threatening at the same time. Those things don't cancel each other out, but actually make the experience fuller and richer. And the idea of the sublime can be, you know, created from based on your experience of nature, but it can also be we've created all, a new sense of awe at the giganticness of the landscapes we've created where we've made these places that are bigger than ourselves. So we've, in centering ourselves, we've decentered ourselves in a way and made these landscapes that are, have outsized ourselves in certain ways. So, which to some people is absolutely thrilling and as other people is devastating. It's one of the, the exciting parts of painting and for me the interesting part of also being aware and actually focusing on the active participation, this idea of kind of relational aesthetics where actually there's an active um, closing of meaning happening, not just closing, but creation of meaning happening on the part of the person who's engaging in just viewing work. And so it doesn't have this passive notion. And it's one of the things that I like to try and do in the dialogues, and it's why we have the breakout rooms, um, to also give a space for other people to speak and continue the conversations. Before we go into the breakout room, I, I just wanted to ask a quick question because it comes up, I think, in all of your work is this idea of boundaries and liminal spaces being spaces of discovery, exploration, tension, and really, really kind of powerful in the generation of meaning. In Philip, with your work, I see there's always this kind of layering of all of the colliding of different spaces happening that becomes part of your kind of pictorial language. Judith, it's, it's kind of embedded in the whole relationship of the way in which you work and Elsa there's this kind of encounter with something that always happens um, and how that and, and just really throwing out this idea of liminal spaces and boundaries as very fertile. It is it there's a, a source of tension when things meet up with one another and there are ways in which they meet gracefully and happily and ways in which they meet with tremendous um, challenge and difficulty. And, um, and again, the, the thing that might seem very acrimonious could be, um, you know, to somebody else might feel very exciting. So, you know, we, I think, again, we bring our own experiences into these places, but it's a place that where to ask, it's a great place to ask a lot of questions because you see different forces meeting up with one another in a way that um, suggests many, you know, suggest that it's a, su a suggestive place to go. No, I was just thinking, because I don't want to dodge the question, but, um, you know, in, in my, more, my own work, because the scale of the paintings is so vast that they embody a lot of different sort of subplots and narratives that some of which may be really raw in the way that the paint is handled and imply something that is <clears throat> um, maybe not a natural formation, but something that human beings have um, imposed on the surface of the earth. And so these things sort of work in counterpoint in many respects, but I do think for me, the, and I've sort of, most of my work has a horizon line where things sort of dissolve into this sort of ethereal distance, which kind of resolves some of the sort of tensions in the foregrounds of the painting. So I do think there's no question there is this give and take. And the, my process is one of layering an idea on top of an idea and then referencing possibly not intentionally, but as I go on realizing that this reference is something that I've seen in the past and then coming to some point of resolution. But I do feel in a way when I'm done, I want these paintings for me, for me to feel satisfied. I, I want to feel a sense of awe and wonder that this is where we live. This planet is beautiful. We are a species that has has altered the forms on earth in such a manner. And, um, you know, I have my personal feelings. I'm heartbroken about so much of what um, we've done and in, in concerned about where this is all going. But um, in the end, um, there is that feeling of sort of wonder and transcendence that I really want a painting to embody. That was beautiful. Elsa, you had a question, which is what's beautiful for you and how do you think beauty is subjective? Does it differ for different people? It might be in combination with the conversation about liminality, liminal spaces, 
Um, I, um, obviously, I don't think that beauty is a universal, right? Like that would be offensive. Um, I think the way that I, I define beauty is more about like vulnerability, authenticity. Like there's a, there's a feeling that you get. Like I, I wish that I had a word for it, but I think you see it like when you, you look at an artwork that was done with some authenticity and not with irony, not with, it's not leading with theory, like it's leading with feeling. It's leading with something real. You feel it in a one-to-one -one connection with that image. So that's my, uh, that's my way of responding to, to that. Like it's, it's more about uh, an authentic vulnerability. When you see a great painting, it sort of hits you in the stomach. So it's a very intuitive kind of response. And I think the way I, I paint, and I think probably the way both of you, you paint as well, is it is something that you're, you're kind of trusting that intuition that you've cultivated over a long period of time. And then you come to start asking questions. Why, why, is, this, why is this working or not working? I can go into a, a, a gallery or a museum and turn around and see a, muse a, a painting and I'm just, I just am kind of stunned. And then I know somehow it has credibility. And I enter in and I try to somehow decipher and deconstruct and figure out why it is so, uh, you know, so wonderful. Um, and similarly, I can say, you see a, you know, a famous painter or a big, some, you know, big painter in New York go into a gallery and just feel flat, like there's nothing there. And I think that is kind of you, as a painter, you do end up trusting that, I think. And, you know, you can be wrong at times. I've come to like things that I dismissed earlier on and some stuff that I liked, I don't like as much, but by and large, you know, I really do trust that sort of really cultivated intuition. Yes, thank you for saying that. Like you feel it in your gut. Like um, I, I had this moment where I, I'm, I'm wondering if you all have watched the, the film Gerhard Richter painting, like where we're, we're in the audience witnessing an actual abstract painting happening. And there was a really beautiful moment where, so we're watching him painting and there is this moment where, you know, a, a swipe of a stroke reveals like this little perfect patch of yellow and green underneath a you know like a black painting stroke and i heard a, an audible gasp from the audience like we all saw it like there was a moment where i think we, we were like that's beautiful don't touch it and we we all knew what what richter knew like it it happened and i i don't know like that to me was uh, was such a profound moment like that that we're we on a on a gut level we have this sense of of what is what is beautiful like what's that moment of wonder magic like when all these things kind of come together we we feel it but i think sometimes that's revealed over time too i mean it's a time experience for me there are many times when i see work that i don't even necessarily really respond so positively but it's com there's something about it that makes me want to look many times and to me that's one of the most exciting things um is you know it's it's like you know you could have a piece of candy and it's gone really quickly or you could have something that's maybe sweet and savory at the same time and it, it keeps revealing itself to you over time so um there's something that makes you want to look that does get you right in the uh, in the gut mm -hmm. but it might not instantly be the happiest thing. Um, so anyway, um, it can be really an exciting experience to, to learn a work over time. And to me, those are the works that sometimes last with me the longest, the ones that I didn't necessarily know right away that I loved so much, but it was in really in thinking about them and that they offer enough complexity, even if it's a very simple image, that, that it, it keeps me looking. Yeah, I, I have to say that I, I also, there, there's obviously something which is the immediate draw, but there's something about the, the internal coherence that is created by this almost um, synergistic coalescence of elements and lots of different things happening that you can come back to and that unfolding happening, which can be re really very exciting as well. And so there are so many different things. And again, I, I really don't believe that there's one answer for everything. 
I think some paintings function on some levels and um, other paintings functions on other, function on other levels. And so one will unfold over time and you can come back to. And I, I also love this idea of Phillips, which is that we change. We mm -hmm. learn, we grow, we develop. And I n really painfully realized the day that I suddenly noticed myself walking in a big museum and you know, you have that kind of like, no, 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 ooh. And you suddenly go, who the hell did I just say no to? Just like that, I went, no. And I'm not gonna spend my time on that because literally we wouldn't have time to spend on every single painting and suddenly being aware that there's also something in you that actually makes the work unfold is, is really quite um, responsibilizing in a sense. It's exciting, but it's also that synergistic process. I do think great painting gets better with time. It keeps giving. And that's really an important thing. I mean, even, you know, it could be a Matisse or it could be Bruegel. There's something over time that becomes richer and fuller and it doesn't lose that mystery. Whereas, and you know, just to qualify what I said, I think you can go in and see, you know, a, a big splotch of color and wow, but that's not so much what I'm referring to. It, does it maintain that sense of mystery, that sense of authority, that kind of, um, you know, the, the presence? I've experienced painting as a, a three-part sort of language where, where one part is performative, where, where you, you, it's more like uh, your assignment in school or a commission where you, you have a very specific parameter within which to perform. The other one is closer to what uh, Elsa was talking about that, that's more like processing something and, and you use it as a, as a sort of uh, inward sort of process for yourself and about yourself and for yourself generally or about the world I guess it can be and the other one is is more of an expressive sort of aspect where, where you you generate you generate an idea and, and it being a separate language from the verbal language you, you put it into, into a painting and you give it visual form so I don't know I, I, I very interested to, to hear you, your opinion the whole idea of audience, you know, comes into question, like, who are you painting for? And in the end, um, I really feel like I am interested in a kind of experience that is my personal experience, that if it becomes then a point which becomes universal, but if I try to anticipate an audience or paint to an audience, you know, I've had, you know, even a couple of occasions, you know, potential commissions. And I just, I really given up doing that because I cannot anticipate what people want. I just, you know, it has to become what it becomes. And, and you know, ideally I have, no, I, I have no real control over anything other than the size of, you know, in, in the end, because for me to succeed in a painting, I have to like basically have a train wreck and then put it back together. So I don't know if that <laughs> is, uh, makes any sense, but, Elsa might have a more, <laughs> a better answer. I mean, I might, I might have kind of a, I might have a strange answer to that. So I, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm never, you know, specifically thinking about a specific audience, but um, it just so happens like I'm, I, all right, I'll tell a very specific personal story. So uh, when I started my, my art career, like I had my first gallery and I made a painting, I won't describe it, but it was like a very dark, dark kind of melancholic painting. And uh, the gallery director hated it. She was just like, I, no one will like this. This will not sell, right? Like this is, you know, you shouldn't have brought this in. And so I just made this very dark painting and I'm like, okay, I guess I made that painting for myself. That's fine. And so uh, that painting might have lived on my website for a couple of months, right? Like I, I'm just like, I'm just gonna put it on my website. And I ended up getting an email from a young man um, where he shared with me that that particular painting, like the image of that painting and like two other still lives that I had done 
were the images that he watched on rotation during physical therapy. Like he, he had some kind of, he had a, a, a chronic illness of some sort, and I won't give details about him, but he responded to this very dark painting and that I thought, you know, like I, I just kind of painted that for, for myself perhaps. And um, receiving that message, I, it, it brought me into conversation with like the possibility that yes, even though we are making images for ourselves and like based on, on, on our own experiences and, and aesthetic preferences, like, they do reach an audience and i i have a, a rather romantic idea that that they end up they end up where they need to end up right like the right people end up seeing it perhaps so and i've i've had that um that experience that i've had that experience happen i won't say like dozens of times but enough times where where you know people will will write me these very intimate emails about something that an image prompted in them right and um i take that to heart like there's no way that i uh, that i uh, you know approach a new painting totally blank like no i'm thinking about the potential of of deeply connecting with someone yep Judith, Eric said something about that having been something you talked about um, maybe in the breakout room. Is there anything you want to add? Well, I, I already sort of discussed it, but um, uh, I did talk about that. I do wish my work to be in conversation with other people who are interested in looking at images that deal with, you know, the, the subject of my work and with other artists, but that the idea of an audience is, is something I don't think it's that useful for me to think about every all the time when I'm working. Um, it's something that um, that you know the experience of being in the studio and then having the work leave the studio. They seem like very different experiences for me right now. Um, but um, uh, but I do also feel in conversation with art history and all kinds of you know an audience can be all kinds of different things for all, in different times. My question is for Elsa. Um, and it's regarding the trauma that she talked about. I was surprised to how much I could relate to her trauma because similar, similarly to her, um, I grew up in a poor neighborhood. Um, I'm a person of color. Um, I'm, I'm an immigrant actually. And I was on permanent childhood lockdown um, because my mom didn't want me um, to go outside. And um, I still struggle with this because I also, like, when I talk to people about it, I'm not sure that people understand it. Um, it's a soft version of trauma that is difficult to explain because nothing uh, extravagant has happened. Um, and I also have trouble explaining it myself. So I was wondering, um, and it, it, I want to know from Elsa, um, if you feel understood, do you think that whatever way you express your trauma, either in painting or in text or in expression or in dialogues, do you get sometimes a feeling that the other person don't get you, but are there scenarios where you feel like the, other, the person gets you fully? Um, and also, how did you get to finally make peace with the trauma and be able to talk about it easily. Um, if you ever get to do, if you ever got to do that, I'm not sure. Thank you for that. I mean, that's a, that's a big question. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, thank you for, for sharing your story, obviously. And, um, you know, uh, I, I mentioned, you know, just moments ago about receiving emails from people. So in, in regard to like, if I ever feel understood, if I have felt understood, like fully understood, um, yes, like I would have to say like, um, because of these very personal messages that I've gotten from people, like I could, you know, like, and they can be referencing just like a seascape or just like a landscape or a portrait. And uh, I, what I get in response uh, from these individual people are, deep stories about their own trauma 
like people share with me these very traumatic things that have happened to them and so that, that makes me know that i am not just transmitting just like i'm i'm not just painting just this realistic landscape right like that it goes deeper than that like if if it's it's landing on someone else in a very in 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 that type of way like that makes me feel extremely understood to be honest with you that it took me a uh, it took that was a very long process like i'm i'm 37 years old um and in the art world right like traditionally like your your audience is art history right like you are in conversation first and foremost with art history and to you know i that's never been my primary lens and i just had to uh, i just had to make peace with that i'm like i i am moving through the world with a particular value system and lens and so i have i i'm going to embrace that so really i i just feel like the more i stated that value system like when i was having shows or even like these studio visits one on one with people like i would just i would lead with that like i would lead with my value system and that is what started to to bring to bring the right people to me to, you know it started to attract the type of people that were interested in these conversations so that's how it happened thank you i'm very personally interested in the relationship of of our changing ideas of the sublime and the relation and the landscape and i can't help thinking when i see your paintings where you have uh, people facing into the canvas not facing us um and they're they're facing into some mysterious void and i can't help thinking about uh casper david friedrich um and his you know having having these witnesses peer into the picture space um you know as witnesses to the sublime and i'm just wondering if that ever consciously you know, came into your thinking. I was just going to say that the sublime has come up in the conversations with Philip right. and Judith as well. So it's it's something that I'd love to kind of open it up to to a kind of general conversation about it because it's such a potent subject. And in a sense, that Caspar David Friedrich being the in the introduction, kind of literally, if you look at that iconic painting, it's literally an X marks the spot in the composition. And I've always seen it as quite a kind of self-congratulatory moment in um, kind of German idealism, which is there's something so big that we can't experience it, but we can conceptualize it. And so, God, aren't we great? And there's this kind of self-congratulatory response in the sublime that's embedded in it. And there's also obviously the idea of awe and transcendence, which has come up. And I'd love to kind of open up that idea of the sublime to the three of you. Well, there's also the idea of terror, and I think that's uh, in how terror is somehow inextricably tied to um, beauty and, and, and transcendence. And I think that is really, you know, relevant to, you know, feeling small and uh, somehow impotent in relation to all the forces that are there. And, and we, as human beings, are an evolutionary force. So I think the sublime is a really complex concept that is really fascinating um, because it simultaneously is exhilarating and terrifying. And, and I think even in terms of the subject matter, the Anthropocene, we're witnessing this, this thing unfold and there is something that is, it is uh, terrifying. And, and yet there are aspects of, every aspect of this earth, I think is, you know, on some level is beautiful and has potential to be really, even, even when we are doing horrible things. So there's beauty and desecration, I think, on some level. So, I mean, the sublime, I think, um, is really interesting in relation to this topic. Um, I, I, it, since Penny asked specifically about the, um, the images, right? The images looking into the void. So I'll share that those were, and I've never published this on my website, but I've privately come to think of, of that series um as as titled cada cabeza es un mundo so in spanish that's uh each head is a world each head is it, each head is its own world and um i i don't want to take up everyone's time but that's um that's how i've privately kind of come to think of 
I don't know, like identity politics, right? Like there's, there's a place for, for organizing populations into, into identity politics. Like it's, it's useful to some degree. And then to another, another degree, we are each profoundly mysterious. Like each human is rather unknowable, even to our own selves is how I feel. And, and so those, that series of portraits was about that. It's, it's about the unknowability of, of a person. And um, yeah, like I, I hope that what is communicated because of the way that I, that I apply paint is a rather, um, there's a sensitivity there that I'm, I'm hoping is inviting, right? Like there's a certain amount of compassion for that individual that you don't know. That's how I think of that series. Thank you for that question. I've, I've thought a lot about the sublime and I, one thing that I would add, I mean, I agree with what Philip was saying about, you know, carrying with it these different, these opposing characteristics, the experience of the sublime. But I think the sublime has been used um, to attach to a landscape as a way not to really feel that we have affected it anyway. And thinking that um, we can look and see this beautiful remote landscape that we call the sublime as a way to not take any responsibility for it also, as if it is, you know, eternally generating in and of itself. And without recognizing that what we're doing on the, our left hand is not affecting what's going on, on our right hand. Um, isn't that so, just, uh, if I may interrupt just yeah. one second, isn't that kind of a 19th century notion though of the sublime, the idea of the vast wilderness, yeah. whereas yeah. even in your, your work, the kind of this sort of infinite structures become terrifying in a different way and it's a kind well, of landscape. Exactly, that's what I was yeah. sort of getting to because I feel like a lot of people have held on to that 19th century idea and I think it's yeah. been very destructive and um, that I guess earlier, maybe I was seeing the breakout session or here, I can't really remember, but that, you know, this whole idea that we've created landscapes that have become a new sense of the sublime Line, and you know sort of in a in a terrifying but also um, incredibly energetic way so again you could see the industrial landscape is something that is quite beautiful in a way it has an orderly you know there's like you know a lot of people think oh it's it's so orderly it's so beautiful it mimics patterns that you might find in nature too um, and but you know we've built these places like you know I when I did work about the Panama Canal for instance where you you don't see the human beings in that landscape they're too small to really even identify and we've created this kind of a landscape and yet this landscape then has unleashed other kinds of powers that in turn act on nature so it's this sort of loop of um, that where I feel like we've not really considered all the consequences along the, and along the way. And I agree, it is a, a totally a 19th century idea, but I think that people hold on to it because then they don't have to take any responsibility with it because it, it necessarily sets up a situation in which, you know, if nature's never changing and it's out there, what does it matter what I do? So this question was for Elsa, but it could be for anyone. But, um, okay, so you, Elsa, you said that you feel, I think you said that you feel that beauty is not, there's no universal definition and that you define it as authentic and vulnerable. This, I wrote this down, but I also just wanted to ask. So, um, and I said, it seems to me the people who award grants and fellowships should develop more sensitivity to the nuanced visual language of artists and recognize that creating beauty is not in itself a reaction is in, its, is in itself a reaction to trauma and is a valid response to trauma. So I'm, I'm questioning why beauty and, and painting trauma are two different things. I don't know if we should single out people of color and demand that they express things a certain way. Shouldn't there be a, more of a sensitivity to uh, maybe the fact that maybe you're your expression of beauty is in a, your response to trauma. I'll agree with that. I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> there is, there is something to be said. I don't want this to sound like a conspiracy theory, but the fact that institutions and the art market supports, um, supports people of color artwork primarily when the subject matter is trauma it there's something to be said about that you know like that um the response to to my work is seeming um without my explaining it 
uh, the fact that that they responded by saying like you you can't paint this like there's not there's not enough pain in here like there's that feels sinister to me it seems outrageous to me yeah you know? yeah like there's a there's a a plan there to to want to keep people traumatized is what i feel right like that there's only there's only one authentic way to respond to your your personal traumatic history which is to then perform it for a white wealthy audience that seems really dark to me so yes i would love for there to be a much broader conversation about the ways that we are allowed and supported in in responding to our personal histories thank you in in our breakout room the idea of narrative and how you tell narratives um came up and actually one of the people who made a comment worked with kids who were had projects that they had to kind of work with the landscape as a narrative and one thing that comes up often and is embedded in a sense in the work that all three of you make is whose narrative is this idea of landscape painting and who where does it come from what history does it embed and all three of you have a response to the whole of the stories that have been told and it's come up in this session um, of the different stories that we've been told about the landscape and whose it is who can paint it why we're painting it and what it does to actually engage in it painting it as an act of showing something that's going on and so that kind of ties everything together and i think it's really fascinating um, and one of the things that has also really interested me is this idea how those stories can be about personal relationships but about the embodied relationship that you have with the landscape and the environment that you live in, but also with a kind of critical awareness of the history that that comes from. Judith was talking about, um, and, and Philip too, um, painting these spaces that have been um, distorted and reorganized by um, industry. Um, and Judith, I looked at your Panama paintings um, in particular, and how that is, um, how to talk about that with an audience that sometimes might um, respond to it with a sense of nostalgia and, um, um, and it, is it even necessary to, if, a, if an audience is seeing it differently than perhaps you intended to feel like you need to communicate that verbally or if that's just okay. If people only receive it as a lovely, beautiful thing and are not somehow um, seeing that the intent was to um, point out that human in intervention in the landscape. I just think that painting um requires imagination on the part of the viewer. I mean, and um, the knowledge that you, that you bring to experience something, you might appreciate something because it's, you know, really got nice, beautiful colors. And in there is that there are different levels of understanding a work of art, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And really, you can only be responsible for making the painting. And I think people evolve. And I know myself, I told my students this, that, you know, I, when I was 20, I went to museums, I'd see a painting, I'd, oh, he's no good or something, or she's no, and then come back in like 20 years, I'd say, God, did that painting change? You know, like, is that the <laughs> same painting? I mean, obviously, you evolve, you become a more insightful person, hopefully, over time. So, you know, all you can do really is make the paintings and hope that people, um, because I think great painting has a lot of layers of complexity and possibilities. They unfold over time. And I think that's something that really, you know, if something you sit with and it still has that sort of presence and sense of, you know, expanding possibilities, I think that's really the mark of, of something that is a great painting. I think I said before, I, I think that, you know, you don't want, paintings should be rich experiences. And, and it is, you know, an act of looking is something to be, that's learned over time too, for some people. But I, I, I don't, I, I try to be, to again, not have my paintings be a blunt instrument. I mean, 
I think that you don't want to tell people what to believe and what to think about this. I don't, I don't really have an interest in that. I'm really interested in the questions. And if someone, you know, Meg thinks it's just a beautiful, benign, cute little picture, well, <laughs> you know, there's not that much I can really do about that. I mean, uh, you know, you know, I, I know I could sit in a room and talk to somebody and ask them questions and hopefully, you know, you could get them into a conversation, but you know, you want the work to speak for itself too. And, um, you know, I'm not here to be speaking beside my paintings to explain them to people. Um, I guess, you know, I hope that they encourage people to like Philip was saying to keep looking. I mean, I don't, I don't think you should, you know, hopefully you just don't take it in and sort of spit it out. That's, it's just not that simple an experience. Um, but, but some people, you know, don't really are, are impatient. And part of the problem of our culture in a way is a, a sort of a diminishment of our attention span and a willingness to go and sit in front of something that maybe you don't respond to. You know, we we're talking earlier about things that just hit you in the gut initially right away and you're open to it. But then there are those experiences of paintings that you might think that really makes me uncomfortable and I don't really like next, being next to it, but maybe it asks, it asks you to think about why that is. Um, so, you know, I guess in my own work, I just hope that there's something that makes people want to look again and maybe look a third time and hopefully even beyond that. So, um, I, you know, but I, I, I can't tell people how to see the work. And of course, there are times when it's disappointing <laughs> because you want to, you, I don't make it just for myself. I, I make it, um, you know, I feel compelled to make paintings. Absolutely. But I feel I don't, I don't live in a world by myself. Um, so you interact with people and you have to be generous too, to, to be kind to people who are looking also because people bring their own experiences and maybe their own experiences make it difficult for them to encounter what you're thinking about. So it's, it's not just about what I think it's, you know, it's other people's experiences too. And there's an act of generosity that is, it's reciprocal, I think. Um, so, um, of course, I want people to respond the way I would hope they would respond with enthusiasm or with questions or with interest. But, um, you know, it doesn't always happen. And it is a very subjective thing. We're making things that mean things to us. And hopefully they mean our own enthusiasms, encourage other people to be enthusiastic to engage with it. But, um, you know, it is a subjective thing. And finally, we all have our own experiences we bring. So I try to be respectful of other people's experiences also as they come towards my work. You use the word questions. And I think that's really kind of hits the nail on the head. Like I would like people to be brought in to the painting, but also that then it is thought provoking and elicits certain kind of questions. And in my relationship to the environment, to land use, the intervention, that sort of thing is really what kind of questions do these provoke? What, how, what is the association? And the more forcefully I can do that, I think the more successful you know, I've been. I get the pervert nature of um, being asked as a person of color to paint uh, people of color's tears for white people to, to, to watch. Uh, but there is also an argument that can be made for having certain narratives present first but also the fact that our bodies are inherently political, which by that I mean simply your presence, Elsa, can make some people uncomfortable. Um, and you can, you, you can, like, I think for me, I can try to pretend that it's not the case. And, um, but in fact, it's unescapable. And the second question that I have is about the place uh, that human has in the Anthropocene, and I'm wondering if his uh, if humans are outside the Anthropocene. By that I mean, when you're painting nature, there is like maybe not in the Friedrich painting, but in most painting, human the human is not present. So one might think that he's outside the scene. But at the same time, if you're painting trauma, then that's a human experience. If you're painting land use um, and the idea of ownership, then that's a human experience. If you're painting beauty and painting that might look neutral, then that's also a human perspective on what beauty is. So is a human so central in works of art that try to avoid the human? Actually, is it, when I said at the beginning in the introduction, the Anthropocene is 
probably something we'll come back to um, because it's just such a huge subject. I'd like to do a session on the Anthropocene and perspective um, because I think that the idea of perspective is linked to anthropocentrism um, and it's dominated pictorial language for a long time. I also think that there's a huge space for a conversation about um, art that isn't necessarily just about the human perspective, um, not just from uh, people like Jamie Wyeth who, who make portraits of animals in a very sensitive way with um, the individuality that each animal has, but also the idea of object-oriented ontology, which is, has a whole positing of art that is beyond the human sphere. I mean, the, this conversation is huge and I, and I just, uh, I go back to, um, Elena, what you, what you talked about in, in the introduction, right? Like we, even the use of the word Anthropocene, right? As if just humans broadly are responsible for our current situation, our current climate crisis, but it's more specific, more accurate to say that it's the progress of Western <coughs> colonialism the idea of progress, like not everyone is equal for the Anthropocene. So that's what I do want to add here, like um, that there needs to just be more responsibility and more, um, we need to be more accurate about the terms that we use when we say that, that humans have destroyed the planet. It's a conversation that is important to kind of qualify the term because I think Anthropocene is, more and more being um, accepted. But when you suddenly hear discourses about we, we all need to pull together because it's more important than certain other issues, divisive issues, and you're thinking, hang on a second, isn't this really handy that now it's about all pulling together? And so for me, it's the term Anthropocene has its kind of problematics embedded. Um, I would love to offer the opportunity to our three speakers to kind of add any closing thoughts that they want to throw in. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here. I just want to thank you, Alina, for organizing this conversation. It was really terrific. And I enjoyed meeting fellow artists and, and the fellow artists in our breakout room. The, mo most of the people there seem to be painters as well. So it was really um, a pleasure to be able to have this conversation. So I just want to thank you and thank you, my fellow panelists. Agreed. Yeah. Strongly yeah, agree. No, I, I, it's really uh, <clears throat> remarkable. I'm still actually uh, thinking about that introduction. I wish I could hear it again. <laughs> I was, as you were, as you were uh, going on, I thought, you know, this is really pretty interesting what she's saying. <laughs> I thought she, you really put that together in a kind of flawless way and it covered so many topics. I was, I was really impressed. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so thank you all. Really a pleasure meeting everybody and, <clears throat> and um, look forward to the next one. Thank you. I'm in agreement with everyone. This was wonderful and informative and I greatly appreciate the conversation. If people have thoughts, I'd like everyone to feel like this is also a space where you can drop an email um, at Elena Sedler at dialogues um, for artists.com. If anyone has ideas and thoughts about speakers or things that they want to see happening, then I'll, I'll bring them on board and, and learn from them as well. Thank you again to our three speakers. Thank you, um, Judith Belzer. Thank you, Philip Govedair. I still have this kind of tendency of wanting to say Philip Govedare. Yes, I like <laughs> that. Great. <laughs> and thank you, Elsa Munoz. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here, the three of you today. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you.